Hey everybody, it's TJ with Avidyne again, and in the following short video, we're going to discuss the IFD interface to a gray code altitude encoder. As always, everything in this following video is for reference use only. It's just for informational purposes. For FA approved data, please refer to the IFD installation manual and make sure you're looking at the latest revision. All right, so before we jump in, I want to discuss a little bit about what gray code is uh, for some of the younger folks that may not be accustomed to it or, or may not have seen this before. Uh, you may also hear it referred to as Gillum code. So what gray code or Gillum code is, is it's a zero padded 12 bit binary code that uses a parallel 11 wire interface. And ultimately what it is, is it's just a series of highs and lows, ones and zeros that equates to some barometric pressure altitude that systems can receive on that bus and determine what the barometric pressure altitude is of the aircraft at any given time. Um, the way that it works is between these 11 wires every time one of those bits any one of those bits changes state it equates to a 100 foot difference in altitude um, but there's a sequence that it follows and we're not going to get into all of that detail um, there are plenty of charts and stuff you can go out there and google you know gray code altitude uh, and there's all kinds of charts you can come up with that, that are going to give you all of that information I'm not going to go that deep into it here but I do want to discuss the interface of it and and how this kind of works and some troubleshooting tips. <clears throat> so, here's the interface with the IFD. Um, some transponders and altitude encoders do not have internal isolation diodes that prevent the unit itself from pulling the encoder lines to ground when the unit is not powered on, when it's off. Okay? Those units do require the installation of a diode into the harness for each encoder line. So if you look at this, we've got 11 lines here, and each one of those is going to have to have an isolation diode in it in some cases. The IFD has its own internal isolation diode, so we don't have to worry about that. But if we're connected up to some old legacy equipment that may not, there may have to be diodes in these lines. Now, that being said, uh, I hope you guys are seeing already that that if we're talking about a brand new installation, if you can avoid using gray code, I would highly recommend it. Um, number one, 11 wires is labor intensive. And now if we're talking about sending that altitude to multiple places in the aircraft, that's 11 wires times however many pieces of equipment are in the aircraft. And if some of those pieces of equipment are, um, you know, legacy equipment that don't have internal isolation diodes, now you're talking about at least 11 diodes that have to go into the system it becomes very labor intensive very quick for the cost of a an rs-232 encoder it's just not really worth the effort in my opinion um although you know some of these aircraft already have you know this encoder installed and that's what we've got to deal with so so we're going to go through the details of it but um, for a brand new install you know and the cost uh, associated with an rs-232 encoder i would definitely recommend going that route um, just from an installation standpoint, you'll save enough money on installation labor to pay for the encoder itself uh, in most cases. So, that being said, um, for a lot of these legacy installations, you know, they may still have gray code encoders installed. Um, the other upside to RS-232, just for what it's worth, is that RS-232 can get you down to, you know, 10 foot accuracy on your altitude. Uh, gray code is always going to be 100 foot increments, so uh, maybe you can sell it that way. Um, altitude line D4, which equates to the P1001 connector on the IFD at, at pin 70, if this is installed in a helicopter, that line is reserved for a weight on wheels input. Uh, typically that would be looking for a line coming from the cyclic. So if you're configured as a helicopter, it changes the function of that input pin, and it's no longer looking for, you know, gray code altitude data there. It's looking for 
an actual you know squat switch input coming from like a a cyclic switch you should also be aware that the IFD will accept altitude from multiple different places and there is a priority scheme built into the IFD that determines you know which one it's going to take over the other so as you can see here the IFD priority scheme takes air data 429 as highest priority next is 429 EFIS data next is 429 from a traffic system um, fourth is RS-232 from uh, an FADC fifth is RS-232 from an altitude encoder and sixth is parallel altitude encoder or gray code um, so this is the lowest priority that the IFD will accept in as well whenever you've got multiple altitude sources in the aircraft it's really important to understand what the priority scheme is on whatever this stuff is connected to um, because you may go through all of the effort of installing all 11 wires along with 11 diodes uh, to isolate an old gray code system to the IFD um, and at the same time you've got let's say an Aspen EFD 1000 connected to the IFD it's going to ignore that gray code encoder anyway so all of that work you did was for nothing it's going to listen to 429 data coming from the EFIS so once we get this thing installed, if we're using this old legacy equipment and, and we're, we're rocking and rolling with it, typically what we find when we have a gray code issue, it's due to one or more of the lines being open or shorted. Where this becomes not a lot of fun to troubleshoot is the only time that you would actually see the indication that one of these lines is open or shorted is when you are passing through a given altitude where that specific line should be changing state either from a high to a low or from a low to a high so it, it becomes a little bit of a bear to troubleshoot but I'm going to show you guys some tricks here that make it a little bit easier with an IFD um, what causes these lines to be shorted or open well open is pretty self-explanatory you got a broke broken wire somewhere a busted wire um, but typically, like I had mentioned, uh, with these gray code, these older gray code interfaces, a lot of times that stuff's going to be paralleled, you know, all over the aircraft. So you're going to have 11 wire bundles passed off to two or three different units in the aircraft. Um, there are also often times with older traffic systems where you're going to have gray code fed out to the traffic system. So something to keep in mind but when those lines are paralleled the, the thing you kind of want to think about is if there's a short on one of those parallel branches it's going to pull that entire line low for everything else in the system unless there are isolation diodes in the way that prevent that from happening and in that case you're only going to see that problem on the one unit that it's connected to that's causing the problem or on that that branch that's physically shorted okay that's part of the the beauty of I, uh, diode isolation <clears throat> but it's also the part that makes diode isolation not a lot of fun to troubleshoot because there's a lot of different things that can be happening here so let's let's go through a couple of them um, as I had mentioned when, when it was fairly new there were a lot of different units that they designed that would take this gray code information in um, but they never really gave it a lot of thought as to, you know, what if these lines are all paralleled in seven different places in the aircraft. With newer equipment, just about everybody that takes gray code in now, they have uh, isolation diodes built into the receiver so that you don't necessarily have to worry so much about it. However, um, something to look out for is if everything connected on a gray code parallel system like this has internal isolation diodes it's also possible for that internal isolation diode to fail on that unit and if it does it can absolutely pull that line low or leave that line open <clears throat> uh, typically you're going to see it as, as a pull pulling the line low though um, where it'll never change state to open so in that scenario you know it's always a good idea to understand fully what all is connected to this parallel gray code system and if you're troubleshooting one and you think that you know maybe one of the lines is being pulled low 
find where that problemed altitude is, wherever that transition is supposed to take place and it's not, and then start disconnecting stuff from the system. So if you've got a traffic system, just disconnect the connector off the traffic system and see if that you know, makes the system come to life. If everything else looks okay after that, then you know that, that the isolation diode in the traffic system is shorted. So typically what we see, yeah, like I had mentioned, is either an existing diode in the wiring has failed. Um, usually when diodes fail, they fail open. Um, and when that is the case, whenever you've got an open diode, that problem is generally going to be isolated to only the receiver connected to the line with the open diode. Um, it's not going to pass an open to the rest of the system. So anything else connected in parallel is going to operate just fine. What we also see, though, is with somebody going in and doing a new installation, sometimes these younger techs get a little bit confused about what direction a diode should go in the system. When that happens, uh, you know, we do see some, some issues sometimes where folks have gone in and installed the diodes backwards. By design, diodes are supposed to go in only one way, only one direction like an electrical check valve and since gray code lines are considered active when low a diode installed backwards is going to have the effect of not allowing that specific line to ever go active it's not going to allow that specific line to ever go low so if the receiving device on that line defaults to a logic high that logic high can be passed on to the cathode side of the isolation diode connected to any other parallel receivers also preventing those lines from ever going active okay so basically what it's like is it's like your your check valve is open another issue that we see sometimes is that the connected receiver has an internal isolation diode and one of those has failed either shorted or open usually open um, and when you've got all of the receivers connected, all have their own internal isolation diodes, it makes this a little bit trickier to troubleshoot. Because whichever unit is causing the problem will have an effect on everything else that's connected in parallel. So, talking about diodes, um, <clears throat> we'll get in here and, and do a little bit of an explanation as to how diodes work for some of the younger techs uh, might be able to to use this as a refresher. Some of us older guys could probably use this as a refresher as well. So let's talk about it. Um, if we're troubleshooting a diode problem, and, and I'm talking about, in this case, a diode that's actually physically in the line. Somebody's put the, the diode in the line to isolate these things. Um, most of your modern multimeters have a diode checker function. So you got to kind of understand how the diode works to understand how you hook your meter leads up to it. Um, the way that, that the diode is designed, you've got an anode side and a cathode side. The anode side is going to be the positive side. The cathode side is going to be the negative side. So, whenever I'm hooking up a multimeter to this thing with using the diode checker function on my digital multimeter, I'm going to put my red wire or my red lead to the anode side, and I'm going to put my negative lead, my black lead, to the cathode side. What this should do, using 9-volt battery inside my multimeter, is it should forward bias that diode, and I should see that there is continuity there. Okay? If I flip my meter leads so that I put my red lead on the cathode, the negative side, and my black lead on the anode, the positive side, that should read as an open. Now, understanding these, you know, is important when it comes to checking whether this diode has been installed the, the right direction or not, okay? Um, so the, the thing to kind of keep in mind is that the anode side of the diode should be the part that's connected to the receiver out there, wherever that's at. The cathode side the negative side there 
that should be the side of the diode that's connected to your encoder. Okay? So, um, doing that quick little check, you can kind of check and make sure that all your diodes are good to go. Um, and it should be fairly easy to spot one being installed backwards as long as you kind of understand the logic and what direction these things are supposed to be in the system. But with an IFD, there's an even easier couple of ways to go about troubleshooting this thing. So if you're using gray code into the IFD, you can always go over here to the aux page group, go to the utilities tab, and then click on calculators. And it should take you to the air data calculators page up here at the top. And you'll notice any information up there that you're receiving in green if it's green, that tells you that it's being received by an external source. If it's in white, it means it's not receiving anything from that external source. So, if you guys have a gray code installation and you're doing, you know, a 91.411.413 check or whatever, I always recommend put the IFD on this air data calculators page because it might clue you into any kind of issues that you're going to run into. Um, because this shows you what the IFD is seeing altitude-wise from an external source. Again. That all assumes that the data there is green. If it's not green, the IFD is not seeing it. Okay. And probably the most useful place to go to troubleshoot a gray code interface to the IFD is in maintenance mode. If you go to the main discrete I.O. page, it's under the config tab in maintenance mode. And on this main discrete I.O. page, you'll see that there's a, a block up there at the top for gray code and it will show you each individual line and what the status of that individual line is. So as you can see, this is a huge troubleshooting tool if you guys are trying to narrow down, you know, potentially a bad diode or something like that in one of these old gray code installations where, you know, the wiring is 30, 40 years old. Wiring can become brittle over time and sometimes those wires break and when they do break, they generally will break at wherever the diode is installed in the line because that'll be the most brittle place and the easiest place for it to break. So this can come in really, really handy if you're troubleshooting one of these types of things. Um, you can go in there and look at the individual lines, hook up a pedostatic test box, run the thing up, get yourself a, a chart, you know, print out a chart off the internet, what the, the gray code lines equate to to given altitudes. Um, and run the thing up and, and see if, if all of these lines are transitioning uh, status the way that they're supposed to. All right. Um, that's all for this one. Thanks for sticking with me, guys. Thanks for watching. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.